Hi everybody, this is Nick with Audio Video Export. Uh, pleasure to have you all here with us today and it's really exciting. Uh, we've got the pleasure to talk to you about one of the, the brands that Audio Video Export's carried since its inception more than 14 years ago. And uh, Den and Morantz, well not Morantz, Den at the time, but Morantz we've uh, added to the line card uh, some years ago. We're really excited about that and have been. It's been a great brand for us. Uh, with us, we've got the pleasure you can see if you're watching this live, uh, Matt Garfine. Uh, who is with the, the president of Audio Americas is going to be reviewing some really great information and uh, with us on both. We've got some great new uh, features um, with this new uh, line, right? And uh, that we're going to be going over today. Bear in mind, there are a couple of handouts that you can download in this um, webinar here today. So if you just click on the handouts box, uh, you'll be able to download those. If you're watching this on the YouTube video uh, that we're going to be hosting, uh, posting afterwards, go ahead and just uh, email me directly, nick at av-export.com, or your salesperson or be able to request those. They are also published on our dealers on the dealer section of the Audio Video Export website. So if you're a dealer, uh, one of our dealers in the territory of Latin America and the Caribbean, please do feel free to sign in if you haven't done so already to our dealer section of our website, av-export.com. And there are loads of marketing materials, including the step charts, pricing, uh, as well as a lot of uh, other really great stuff. Uh, there's also just a last bit of um, just uh, maintenance. Uh, the question box, feel free to ask whatever question. I will be actively monitoring that, answering questions as they come along uh, or interrupting Matt, or we've got some time afterwards probably that we're gonna go ahead and answer and field whatever questions there may be. Without any further ado, Matt, thanks for your time for being here with us today and uh, appreciate it and it's all yours. Nice to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Nick. Hello, everybody. My name is Matthew Garfine. I'm the principal of Audio Americas. We're the Latin America sales agency rep firm for Sound United and all of the Sound United brands. And today's presentation is in English. Uh, we are repeating this presentation in Thursday on Thursday at the same time in Spanish. For those of you who might prefer to listen in Spanish, um, we offer you both. If you don't speak English or Spanish, you're out of luck. Uh, but hopefully you speak one or the other. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. This presentation, I'm going to try to make it fit in, in an hour. We're going to cover a lot of information. I'm not going to get into specific uh, specifications or features of products. Instead, of those handouts that Nick mentioned, we recommend you download those handouts. Those are PDFs that are called step charts, and I'll show you later how to use those. Um, that's your best reference if you want to know which products have which features, but uh, we're not going to go over them one by one because that's really boring. Instead, we're going to spend this hour going over um, relevant technologies for multi-room audio and home theater in, in today's market. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera because you don't need to look at me. Uh, let's look at the PowerPoint, which is a lot more interesting. All right, and we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, Danon and Marantz uh, are both part of the Sound United group. Sound United, uh, based in Southern California, is actually the, at the moment, it's the largest group of specialty audio brands under one roof. The group consists of three electronics brands, which are Denon Marantz and Class A Audio, and three loudspeaker brands, which are Bowers & Wilkins, Definitive Technology, and Polk Audio, all owned by the same company with uh, each, each brand has its own dedicated engineering teams, marketing teams, et cetera. But of course, there are certain technologies and parts that are, that are shared between them. I'll give you a little brief history here on Denon and Marantz, which are the, those are basically the uh, the topic of, of today's presentation. Marantz is actually the oldest brand in the ma you know, mass market consumer electronics audio category, uh, founded in 1910. So the brand is now over, uh, over 110 years old. So compared to other competing brands in these categories, Denon is by far the one with the most history. Denon has always been associated uh, with innovation, uh, both on the hardware side and as you'll see later on, on, on hardware and, and technology side. Uh, Denon was one of the first manufacturers of turntables. Back in 1910, um, they were called phonographs in those days, 78 RPM, as you can see in the picture there. Um, initially, the brand was just Nippon Chikwonki Shuoki. Pardon me if you speak Japanese and I just slaughtered that, that name. Uh, in 1944, they actually gave the brand the name Denon, which is a, uh, a word that, that was invented. It's a combination of the two Japanese words for electric and sound. So here, uh, a bunch of firsts uh, throughout Denon's history. First, 78 RPM vinyl records manufactured by Denon. Uh, in 1939, the first vinyl disc recorder. 
in the 50s, the first 33 RPM vinyl records. And by the way, that's something a lot of people don't realize. Denon used to also be a very important record label. The Denon actually manufactured uh, records, vinyl records, as well as compact discs in the 80s. So that was all a big part of their history was the hardware as well as the software. The first cassette players were made by Denon in the 1960s. And the DL-103 phono cartridge, still in production today, unchanged from its original design in 1962. So that one is uh, pretty famous among the audiophiles. Here on the right, you can see an image of the very first digital audio recording device. Uh, it was a Denon product. Denon invented the technology called PCM, which is the base for the compact disc and the DVD, et cetera. Um, and here you can also see an example of a classical music vinyl release by Denon in the 80s. Um, actually, this one looks like it's, it's a compact disc rather than, than vinyl, because Denon did start to make compact discs in 1983. And aside from that, Denon has always partnered with the latest, uh, with the people developing the latest technology for surround sound and home theater. So Denon was always a strategic partner of THX, Dolby, D DTS, um, at, uh, Odyssey. So uh, many of the firsts in, in the world were, were Denons. The first receiver with THX 5.1 was a Denon. The first receiver with DTS ES was a Denon. I think you, you get the idea. And then there's our sister company, which is Marantz. Not quite as old as Denon. It's an American brand established in 1954. You can see in the picture here, this is the first Marantz product called the Model 1. And uh, it was successful right off the bat. Not only did it sound great, it was easy to use. It looked really nice. And, and what's interesting to note is that to this day, Marantz, uh, Marantz designs are always symmetrical. Look at the front panel of a Marantz product, a receiver, stereo amplifier, and compare it to a Denon or any other brand. The Marantz stuff is always symmetrical. And you can see that from the very beginning that the designs always have this symmetricality. And going through the years, here you can see products from the 1970s also maintained that symmetricality. So that's always been one of the things that made Marantz a little bit different. Not only does it perform, but also looks a hell of a lot nicer than, than most of the other uh, brands that it competes with. So the Model 7 preamp, this was a hugely popular product in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, Marantz was very famous for its tuners in the 70s, the 10B being the most famous one. So here's a big question that always comes up, and this is an important one for me to explain, uh, being that we have two brands under the same roof, Denon and Marantz. And when you compare the two, the Marantz is usually about 15, maybe 20% more expensive than the Denon with similar specs, similar specifications. And it's important to understand why and be able to explain why, because your customers will also ask you that same question. So I always like to use the analogy of cars. Everybody knows cars and all the major car brands, especially the really sexy cars like the Audis and the Porsche. So if you compare an Audi Q5 SUV to a Porsche Macan, they both have the same amount of horsepower. They're actually both built uh, on the same chassis. They use the same engine. They have the same core functionality, but the experience of driving them is different. And the Porsche costs about, what, that's about 15% more. Why does the Porsche cost 15% more? Because the driving experience is different. It's got superior handling. It's got some superior equipment like tires, et cetera. And cu customers are willing to pay that premium. They're willing to pay that 15% premium in order to get that extra level of performance. And it's really not very different when you talk about Marantz and Denon. They're both excellent products, but the Marantz for a little more money is gonna give you a little bit of a smoother sound. Generally, Marantz receivers are a little heavier. Marantz uh, engineers put a little more money into the power supplies. You're always using toroidal transformers, details like that that cost more money that mean that the sound is just a little bit more refined. Now, having said that, Denon is a great product for the money. I would say in terms of value for the money, Denon is always going to be the best choice. But for the customer looking for that little extra uh, margin of performance and luxury, Marantz is going to be the brand uh, that, that is attractive to that customer. And just so you know, Marantz and Denon receivers only share uh, about 57% of their parts. And the parts that they share are the parts that are not visible to the end user. For example, what you see outlined in, in yellow here, this is the, the, the digital board. So this, this board has the digital analog conversion, has the HDMI switching, um, some of the video processing. This particular board is the most important component on the bill of materials, and it's shared between Denon and Marantz because with Sound United buying a higher quantities of these from the factories, they can get a better price and therefore offer better value to you, the consumer, in the, in the final product. This image also allows you to clearly see why the, the, the Marantz 
costs a little more. Giant toroidal transformer in the middle here, which Denon doesn't use. Uh, they cost a lot more money. That also makes the product deeper and heavier. So uh, really parts is a big part of the difference. And there are actually two separate engineering teams with two uh, designers responsible for each. So Mr. Takahashi is responsible for, the, for maintaining the consistent sound of a Denon product. And Mr. Ogata has the same job for Marantz. So every time they design a new product, these, these gentlemen, their, their job is to make sure it sounds like a Denon or it sounds like a Marantz and that there's no crossover, that, that each brand has a distinct uh, sound and personality and value proposition. So that's a little bit of background on the brands. So now I'm going to jump into key features, uh, features that are included on the both Denon and Marantz product lines, the current product lines. And I'm not going to go over everything because, of course, the feature lists are really, really long and not everything is, is super relevant. But I'm going to go over the stuff that's most relevant and the most important to your customers. And it's most important for you as a system designer, integrator, installer to understand. And the largest, the biggest advantage that we have that our competitors don't is we have integrated multi-room audio built in to our Denon and Marantz receivers. Every Denon and Marantz model that has, that's networking, that has an ethernet port or Wi-Fi, automatically has HEOS built in. On the Denon side, any receiver that ends with the letter H, it's because it's got HEOS built in, okay? But it's a general rule, anything with networking is gonna have it. So HEOS is a wireless multi-room audio platform. Many of you are probably familiar with it. It works in a very similar way to Sonos or Bose SoundLink. In fact, those three, between, between Sonos, Heos, and Bose, that's like 98% of the market for multi-room wireless audio. And one of the big differences between Heos and Sonos, which is the, you know, the obvious point of comparison, has to do with integration. Um, Sonos has made great strides lately to make it easier to integrate, but that was never really Sonos's main goal. Um, Sonos is more focused on the on retail and, and capturing the entire home, where you know Heos came to the party a little later, and Sound United realized they were never going to be able to compete head on head on with with Sonos, and so their approach was a little bit different. Heos is designed from the get go to be integrated into systems using automation platforms, and it's much easier to integrate than other brands. So how does uh, how does Heos work? It's very similar to the way Sonos works. Everything is controlled with an app. You can listen to the same music in every single zone or different music in different zones and you can use the app to do everything to turn on and off the zones choose the content control the volume etc and every avr that has heos built in that avr automatically is a heos zone so this is an important point to mention um, we like to talk about how heos built in to down on Marantz receivers gives you what is essentially a trojan horse right the, the trojan horse is that you're, you sell a home theater system to your customer and you tell them, hey, go into the menu, go into the setup menu and enter in your Spotify account. And you can listen to Spotify in your home theater system. And by the way, if you want to add another speaker in your kitchen or in the bedroom or for the balcony or for the, for the living room, come back and see me next week or next month. And I've got other options. For example, the den at home line of powered speakers. And there's some other components as well. So we say Trojan horse because the customer buys a home theater system. And as soon as he realizes he's got Spotify there, and you can easily add another speaker or speakers to other zones in the house, well, suddenly you're capturing the home. You're not only selling the home theater, you're selling the additional uh, multi-room solutions for their other, other zones in the house. So this leads to recurring revenues for you, for you, the dealer. So HEOS, the architecture of HEOS allows for a maximum of 32 zones. And within those 32 zones, you can have up to 16 of them playing the same stream. So you could have 32 zones, 16 of them playing one, uh, one type of mu one music stream, the other 16 playing the other. Or you can have up to eight different simultaneous different streams of music playing. HEOS offers very good room-to-room -room synchronization. So as you walk from one zone to the next, you're unlikely to notice any kind of a electronic delay between the zones. We offer the ability for stereo pairing of the Denon Home speakers or the legacy HEO speakers. In the app, you can set them up in stereo and use two instead of one. And another difference between HEOS and Sonos, every single HEOS component has local inputs. They have a local inputs that are USB. You can stick a, a thumb drive in there. Um, there's digital inputs and there's analog inputs in the form of a 3.5 millimeter mini plug. Anything you plug into any zone can then be shared and listened to on any other HEOS zone, including Bluetooth. 
if you send us if you send music from a, a cell phone a mobile phone via bluetooth to any heos zone that same music can then be can then be shared with all of the other heos zones the heos ecosystem today is quite large consists of traditional audio components by denon and marantz both home theater and stereo components including streamers we have a family of three powered loudspeakers under the name denon home and we have uh, several options of sound bars and even a powered subwoofer all within the HEOS ecosystem. So I mentioned this a little bit before about the inputs. Here you can see an example of those inputs on the back panel here, as well as you can see the Bluetooth pairing button there. And here's an image of the three Denon Home speakers. Denon Home, the HEOS platform also uses dual band Wi-Fi. It will automatically switch to use whichever uh, frequency is providing the least interference and is compatible with all the latest high resolution formats. Here's a close up of the uh, HEOS app. This is, app is available for uh, Apple, Android, and even Kindle. And what you can do is have different users in the home set up their own HEOS account and save their favorite music, favorite playlist, et cetera. There's essentially three tabs to the HEOS app. At the bottom here, you can see them. The one on the left is the rooms. The one, so this is gonna show you the rooms that are available in, in the system that are that are that are configured the middle one is going to be music so this one is going to show you your choices for streaming music wherever you have your accounts set up whatever services and the one on the right is now playing so in this case you see someone's listening to title and this is the name of the album that they're listening to you can easily toggle back and forth between these three tabs um, to choose rooms choose music or adjust uh, the volume or the track of, of what you're currently listening to so speaking of streaming uh, these are the services that are embedded natively in, in within HEOS. Um, not, this is not everything. We recognize there's always going to be streaming services that are not included, but uh, the Sound United team is constantly trying to add more and more services to, to this list. Um, and by the way, if a customer wants to use a streaming service that is not native to HEOS, they can simply listen to the stream on their cell phone and send that stream via Bluetooth to any HEOS device and then share it from there. So we really are literally compatible with every streaming service there is. And a little more detail here about automation. Um, HEOS is compatible with all of the major automation platforms, including Universal Remote Control, which is sold by Audio Video Export. There are drivers, native drivers, available for all of these platforms uh, for HEOS. So Sound United has made it really easy to start to integrate HEOS uh, into your projects. So switching gears now, let's talk a little bit about immersive audio this is this is actually a pretty fun one and this is a subject everybody enjoys geeking out on um, and it's funny because if you think about the audio video industry over the past let's say 25 or 30 years there have been a lot more advances in video than audio you know video has gotten way better during this time where the basic technology behind loudspeakers and amplifiers hasn't changed much what has changed in audio is the world of surround sound then over time, there have been more and more channels made available for home theater systems. And as of four or five years ago, we have the possibility of 3D sound, or what they call immersive surround formats, of which there are essentially three uh, standards today, which is Dolby Atmos, DTS-X, and RO3D. And a newish one, which is IMAX, which I, I hesitate to call it a standard, because as you'll see, IMAX Enhanced is basically a DTS with, uh, with some tweaks. Um, the Dan and Marantz are, are compatible with all of these formats. Sound United is, is, is not uh, picky. They're, they're agnostic when it comes to you know, partnerships with, with the surround formats. So all of the latest formats will be found in, these, in our products. Some of them will only be in, in models, let's say, from the mid-range level up. Some of the entry-level receivers that have, don't have enough channels, for example, might not offer all of these formats. So really, when we talk about immersive audio, it all started with Dolby Atmos. This was launched in, I believe it was 2014 or 2015. Uh, and this was the first time that there has been uh, an immersive audio uh, format or platform for engineers to create sound effects in 3D. If you think about surround sound up until this point, it was always um, speakers in the horizontal plane set, set up at ear level. In the, in, the, in, in the home theater room. You know, you got your front three speakers and you'd have your surrounds or maybe surrounds plus surround backs. And maybe you mounted the surround backs on the wall, but there really wasn't, uh, there really wasn't sound information, location information coming from above you. Well, that all changed with Atmos. 
So the, the basic theory of, of the way these soundtracks are made is it's a combination of the audio bed and the objects, the sound objects that are placed on top of the audio bed. <clears throat> so the audio bed would be, uh, if we use the example here in the picture, this is an example, example of a jungle. So in a jungle, what would the audio bed consist of? It would be all those background sounds. For example, the sound of the wind blowing in the trees, um, the sound of a river flowing nearby, the sound of thousands of birds, you know, within a couple kilometers, that sort of background noise, that's the audio bed. And then the sound engineer can place specific sound objects in space on top of the bed. So for example, if there's a monkey in, in, in this scene and he's right over here, the sound engineer can place the sound of the monkey exactly here. And if there is a, a, a large toucan bird up on the upper left of the screen, the sound engineer can place the sound exactly here. That's because he can now, I guess triangulate wouldn't be the word, but he has an X and a Y coordinate in his sound mix to precisely place sounds in space. And using a combination of horizontal speakers and vertical speakers, um, he can reproduce those sounds exactly where they're supposed to be um, within the soundtrack. So Dolby Atmos is always a traditional five or seven channel solution at ear level, okay? Adding then two or four height speakers where the sound is radiating from above. And that is the way that the 3D space is, is created. And one of the clever things about Atmos from the beginning is if you're listening to non-native content, Atmos will, will create, uh, artificially create uh, height layer content. So in the same matrix, it works like a matrix, the same way that, that uh, Dolby, um, um, uh, Dolby, the original Dolby Surround worked, uh, or Dolby ProLogic, where it creates, creates data that isn't there using processing. We talk about height speakers. Height speakers are important to, to achieve 3D sound. And there are two ways to, to install height speakers. The most, the preferable way and the most obvious one is to install, it simply install ceiling speakers in the ceiling of the room. And ideally you wanna use the same brand of speakers throughout your entire home theater system. Whether it's Definitive, whether it's Kef or any other brand that AVE or anyone else offers, try not to mix brands because you wanna make sure the tonality is consistent across all of the channels. So in ceiling speakers are ideal. Um, there's no specific spec, you know, the bigger the better in terms of, you know, full frequency response. But as we all know, in Latin America and in the Caribbean, it's not always possible to install ceiling speakers. Um, sometimes the ceiling is made of solid cement and there's just no way to, you know, you don't have the hung ceiling like you find a lot in North America. So a good solution in those cases is to use what we call height models, height modules, excuse me. And a height module is a speaker that would sit on top of your front left and right or your surround left and right. It has its own speaker connection. It's fed by its own amplifier channel from the receiver. And it has drivers that radiate upward at a diagonal angle to the ceiling. So when that sound bounces off the ceiling, it then reaches the listener's ear and it sounds just like it was a ceiling speaker. The, the effect is almost the same. So it's really very convincing and it's a great solution for rooms where you just can't install ceiling speakers. So I'm going to show you um, some simple diagrams of uh, 3D audio configurations. The basic, the basic one would be 5.1.2. This requires a seven channel receiver. That's why you'll notice that our five channel receivers do not have 3D sound because there's not enough channels. You got to have at least five speakers in the horizontal plane at ear level, plus at least two height speakers. Now, when you see 3D audio system spec, you'll see there's three digits. The first digit always is how many speakers are there in the horizontal plane. Second digit is always going to be how many subwoofer channels are there. And that's, by the way, that's always going to be one because the subwoofer, the LFP output is 80 hertz and below. And 80 hertz and below, the human ear does not perceive stereo signals. So there's no point having two different subwoofer outputs in a home theater system. It does make sense to have multiple subwoofers, especially if you stagger their position. So they're not set up symmetrically, and that will even out some of the boominess that you might have in the room. But it's always going to be that point 0.1. There's only one LFE output, no matter how many subwoofers you use. And then finally, that third, uh, that third one, the point 0.2, is how many height speakers there are in the system. So in this image you see here, there are no ceiling speakers installed, but you can see that they have height modules on top of the front left and right speakers that are radiating up toward the ceiling. And that sound then bounces over here to where the listener is sitting. He perceives it just as if there were ceiling speakers installed in the front of the room. 
So here's an example of a 7.1.2 system, in this case, adding the surround backs, maintaining only two height speakers. This requires nine channels of amplification. Here's another way to use nine channels of amplification, sticking with the, the basic five at ear, at the ear level, horizontal plane, and adding four height speakers. In this case, there are four height model, modules installed to recreate the sound of those four ceiling speakers. Nine channel system. Look, an 11 channel system, a couple ways to do that. You could have nine speakers at, at, in the horizontal plane and two for height. This is not very common because you have these front wide speakers, surrounds and surround backs. There aren't many people willing to fill their living room with that many speakers. So a more common approach would be this, 7.1.4, where you've got your three front speakers, surrounds, surround backs, and then four height speakers. And again, in this diagram, it's all height modules to recreate the, the 3D sound from the ceiling, all right? Uh, the Dolby Atmos virtualizer is, a, is, a, is part of the circuit. Um, and this is, this is one I, I sort of hinted at before. Um, if you're listening to uh, a movie and you don't have height speakers in your, in your system, uh, the Atmos virtualizer will create virtual height information. So it will, make you, it, will, it will give you the impression of having these height speakers, even though there are none. In fact, there are not even any height modules. It's a trick of psychoacoustics that is achieved through digital signal processing and uh, adds a lot of adds a lot of sizzle to any kind of soundtrack that you're listening to. Now DTS offers something very similar. DTS X and Dolby Atmos are very, very similar. People at DTS will point out you know, lots of minor details, but as a general rule, the same configuration is going to work just fine for either format. DTS also has a you know, number of different configurations for nine channels or seven channels. Some minor differences in, in the locations that are recommended, but actually that's pretty irrelevant. As you're gonna see in, uh, in a little while, if you use the Odyssey auto calibration system that comes built into the Denon and Marantz receivers, Odyssey will, 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 will inform the receiver exactly where each speaker is located and then it will compensate. So whether you're listening to Dolby Atmos or DTSX, it's gonna sound optimized because Odyssey will do that for you. So kind of like Dolby, DTS offer, offers some options uh, for 3D sound. For example, when there are height speakers installed in your system, but you're listening to an old soundtrack that doesn't have height content, the Neural X circuit will create that content. It adds the height layer, the non-native content, and this is even true for stereo. If you're listening to a stereo, uh, a stereo uh, recording, you can actually set it for all channel stereo and it will actually create height content. And then in virtual X, this is similar to the Adobe virtualizer, the Atmos virtualizer. This is when there's no height channels detected, it will create a virtual, uh, the sensation of having height speakers in the system. All right, so that's Dolby Atmos and DTS X. And then we get to IMAX Enhanced and this is pretty new. This came out about two years ago. And it's basically a, a tweaked version of DTS X. So it's a collaboration between IMAX and DTS. Uh, IMAX is very well known in the professional cinema world. Over 1,200 theaters around the world are installed with IMAX. Now, when you go to your local Cineplex uh, to see the latest blockbuster movie, usually if, you, if it's in the IMAX theater, you might pay you know a dollar more or a couple dollars more for your ticket because the IMAX system is just that much more impressive in terms of the audio and the video presentation. So IMAX wanted to get a piece of the home market. So they partnered up with DTX, DTS um, to create uh, IMAX Enhanced, which is available on Ultra HD Blu-ray discs. Um, and basically what it does, it gives, it's supposed to give you more of a cinema-like uh, uh, presentation, more depth to the, to the bass, more dynamic range, you know, a little more slam. Um, I, you know, I, I honestly have not had a chance to sort of AB uh, IMAX enhanced system versus a standard DTS, so I, I can't speak to how, how effective this really is, but it is an effective marketing tool. Um, almost a half a billion people around the world have experienced IMAX in the theater. So having that logo on the receiver certainly doesn't hurt as a way of attracting more customers to the products. Now, when you take the receiver out of the box, it's gonna come um, already set up uh, by default um, to detect the IMAX signal. There's a there's a flag, right? They call it a flag that's in the sound mix. And when the receiver detects that flag, it's automatically going to go into the IMAX mode. Now that is, you can turn that off if you want to. Um, 
And so here you can see on the configure the, on the setup menu, uh, the surround uh, parameters setup menu of the receiver. If it's an IMAX uh, DTS soundtrack, it's going to say so right here. It'll identify it. All right. So that is IMAX enhanced. It's basically fancy DTS. Then we get to RO 3D. Now this one is a pretty popular in Europe. RO is a, it's a Belgian company that started out making surround sound mixes for classical music about 20 years ago. Um, I have not really heard a full RO demo, but I'm told it's supposed to be more of a musical experience than what Dolby and DTS offer. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that in the Western hemisphere, there is very little interest in RO. Uh, Dan and Morantz have it available. It's built into the receivers in case you'd like to use it. There are some differences in terms of setup and where RO recommends you install speakers. Uh, they also have an option that adds this fourth digit over here, the, that last point one, and that's a, a center, a center uh, ceiling speaker. It's supposed to be mounted right in the middle of the room, and they like to call that the voice of God. So uh, if you're interested in trying that out, RO is available. It's included with all the current Denon and Marantz receivers at no additional charge. It's built in. And that's it for immersive sound. Another tech that's on people's minds these days is voice control. So Dan and Marantz, are, again, are agnostic. We don't prefer one or the other. We work with all three of the, the major voice control platforms. So that's Amazon Alexa, Google Assistant, and Siri by Apple. There are some minor differences in functionality between these three platforms. Um, and this is constantly changing. They're constantly adding more and more features. In fact, this chart itself is probably not even entirely up to date. I know that they've been adding a lot more languages to this. We also offer AirPlay 2, the latest version of Apple AirPlay on all of our networking models. The original AirPlay uh, was like Bluetooth. It was point to point. It was a signal sent from one emitter to one receiver. And you couldn't really network it into a multi-zone system. So Apple saw what was happening with Sonos and Heos and, and wanted a piece of the action. So their version of wireless multi-zone audio is AirPlay 2, and it works essentially in the same way. Any components around the home that are, are AirPlay 2 certified can be used in a multi-zone system to you know, listen to the same music in all the zones or different music in different zones, and you can control the grouping. Uh, obviously works really well with Apple Music. So Apple AirPlay 2, it's, it is built into all of these models and it's also defeatable on all the networking models. Um, defeatable if you'd like to, if you don't want to use it. Here's a feature that many people don't, um, don't know about. Um, but I, one thing that's universal, nobody likes the remote controls that come with audio video receivers. And this is not just a Denon and Marantz thing. You know, look at Onkyo, look at Yamaha, look at all the others. You know, home theater receiver remotes are, are a mess. They have 50 or 60 buttons. They're, they're difficult to use in the dark. A lot of people hate using them. Um, now, if you're installing your home theater uh, within an automated home where they've got, a, you know, one of these nice slick touch panels to control everything, that's great. But there's another option that's super easy as well, which is to control the AVR using your web browser. Uh, you can use it, any kind of web browser on a tablet, on a, on a computer, on a phone. All you need to do is go into the AVR menu uh, make sure that net, network control is turned on, and then it will give you an IP address. And all you do is plug that IP address into your device, into the browser of your choice. It could be any browser you want. And then what you will see is what comes up here on the screen. It's a mirror of the on-screen display configurations for the receiver, except you can do it on your, on your device with a browser instead. So this is available, no extra charge on all network models. So speaking of automation, actually there's a there's a sort of built-in automation on Denon and Marantz receivers at no extra charge. It's a very simple type of automation. And again, this is a feature that a lot of people don't know about. Um, on the Denon products, it's called Quick Select. On the Marantz products, it's called Smart Select. And you'll notice that the, these four buttons on the front panel of the receiver, right, allow you to configure preferences per source. So for example, let's say when you're listening to your Blu-ray disc, right? Um, you set to the surround parameter that you want. Let's say you prefer DTS instead of Dolby. You set to the volume you like to listen at. Press and hold this button number two. The next time you wanna watch a Blu-ray disc, all you do is press that button. It will turn on the receiver. It will go to the, collect, the correct input. 
it will select the correct surround sound parameter and it will put it at the volume that you prefer. So all you gotta do is press and hold for up to four different devices. Uh, and it's sort of an automation light. Also, if you're actually uh, programming um, an automation controller, your URC, Control 4, Crestron, whatever it is, you could actually set up these smart select buttons first. And that makes your job of programming the automation less, less difficult. Because all you have to do is automate the smart select button instead of all of the things that the smart select button is saving. So you can save these all these things in memory, the input source, the volume, sound mode, channel levels, some of the picture adjustments, et cetera. The remote controls also, by the way, have those four quick select buttons built in, all right? Now let's talk about something not quite as fun. There's quite a bit of confusion about EARC. ARC means audio return channel, and E enhanced is the latest version of it. A lot of people don't realize that an HDMI cable um, has, it has 32 conductors. And most of those conductors uh, are made for one-way communication from an emitter to a receiver. Um, but there, is, uh, there are a couple cables in there that are two-way and allow for a return signal. That's why it's called audio return channel. So previous versions of HDMI offered ARC, not enhanced, just the traditional ARC, that allowed you to send a compressed digital signal reversed. So let's suppose that you have an HDMI cable connected from your audio video receiver to your television and all of your sources are connected to the receiver, right? You're gonna send the video from your sources from the receiver to the television through that HDMI cable, right? The ARC allowed you to send audio from the TV to the receiver. Now, a lot of smart TVs nowadays have really nice user interfaces and have streaming built in. So in that case, your, your source is the TV and you need to send the sound from the TV to the receiver. Well, that's where ARC comes in. Now, the advantage of EARC, this is included in the latest versions of HDMI, is it allows for uncompressed digital audio, up to 7.1 channels that you can send from the TV to the receiver. That's, that means uncompressed means there's enough bandwidth to send the the, the 3D audio signals, soundtracks for Dolby Atmos or DTS-X, or the high resolution soundtracks available from Dolby and DTS. So if you think about it, this, this really represents a different way of wiring and designing your home theater systems where it's gonna be TV centric and not AVR centric, right? So let's think this through for a second. Normally, when we design home theater systems, we think about the AVR being the heart of the system. And the sources, let's say you have a satellite, you have an Xbox and you have a Blu-ray player, for example, you connect those to the AVR. The AVR takes care of all the audio and passes the video signal to the TV. And that's the traditional way of wiring up a home theater system. Now with EARC, you can do it differently. With EARC, you could connect your sources to the TV directly. You could connect your Blu-ray, your Xbox, um, and your satellite directly to the TV, uh, and then just send the audio from the TV to the receiver and the video is already connected directly to the TV. So it really all, it all depends how you wanna wire the system. Um, the reason this is a popular option is, to, to, to honestly put, the, the user interface on, on today's smart TVs is, is vastly superior to those on any audio video receiver. They're generally more graphically compelling and easier to use. So a lot of people prefer to do all their switching with the TV instead of the receiver. Thanks to EARC, you can do that without losing any audio quality. Speaking in my video, opinion, Matt, while you're talking about enhanced audio return channel, you're absolutely right that enhanced audio return channel, as far as audio quality, is is really up there and top notch. I think the other main reason that people are choosing this option is because they're using sound bars. Um, yeah. You know, whether that be uh, a, a, the older Heos sound bar that exists or or any other sound bar, it's less equipment that you might need, so it's one fewer, one less point of failure. Um, fewer cables oftentimes are needed. But in my opinion, when you're using this, um, I, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit old school. I still like the tower speakers and you can't get any better than a tower speaker as far as audio is concerned. So you need a little bit more yeah. processing in order to be able to do that. But each one's got its positives and its negatives. And I love this option. It's a great flexibility option. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good point. Yeah, for sound bars, EARC was really kind of a game changer and all the latest generation sound bars that have this. Um, some of the more sophisticated soundbars now even have um, simulated 3D sound with, with, heights, with height information and everything. So soundbars have, have come a long way in the last few years. Yeah. 
So I want to talk a little bit more about video because right now the, the hype is 8K. You know, it's always always around the corner. There's going to be some new video standard that promises higher resolution. You're always going to have some customers that are going to be hesitant to replace or update any, you know, upgrade any of their components because they want to wait, you know, for the next standard. The thing about 8K video that's important to understand is it has nothing to do with the AVR. It, it's totally irrelevant. Okay. The audio that accompanies 8K video is the audio that we already have. It's going to be Dolby True HD, DTS HD. Our receivers already have that. Where are you going to get 8K video from? Well, eventually, when there are sources available, which right now there's very few, it's going to be through streaming services. It's not going to be on a disc. And those streaming services are embedded in the TV. So kind of going back to what I was saying about, about different ways of wiring up your system, if you're going to be streaming 8K um, directly to your TV from your service provider, Okay, that video doesn't even touch the AVR. It goes straight into the TV. And all you need to do is get the audio from the TV to the AVR using EARC. So uh, it's important to understand this because if a, cust you know, if a customer has a really old receiver and you're trying to convince them to, to upgrade and they say, oh, I want to wait for an 8K receiver, you say, well, it's, it's, it's absolutely irrelevant because that 8K signal won't even go through the receiver. It's going to go directly. It's going to be streamed directly to your TV. So it's important to kind of wrap your head around that one. Forgive me, Matt. Uh, just one other thing that I've noticed as a trend that has been happening is that um, as as you're uh, nothing that you said is wrong. You're, of course, you're absolutely 100% right. The the one thing that I've noticed is that um, more and more people are coming to realize that, especially when you've got higher demanding software uh, running on televisions, televisions don't generally do that great of a job as it relates to um, streaming services and putting processors because at the end of the day, you're putting a computer inside of a TV. It's no longer just a display unit, right? You, you've got right. a computer now that's in there in order to be able to have the app, in order to have a store, in order to be able to download the app, then access the internet, in order to be able to download that content, etc. So there are two factors there. Number one is going to be whether the TV has an RJ45 connection or be able to connect to the network directly. Uh, some of them do, some of them don't. So sometimes you may not have the best uh, Wi-Fi scenario in those kinds of cases. But more specifically, as it relates to the computer, what I'm seeing is people are going either to a Chromecast, and again, we're agnostic here, whether that be an Apple TV, a Chromecast, um, my personal preference, this is not an endorsement of any way, shape, or form, but my personal preference, I've got an NVIDIA Shield, which is an Android TV. Uh, it allows for Chromecast, and it's got all the services built in. was designed for gaming light, so we're not talking about an Xbox or a PlayStation 5, but a gaming light venue, so it's got a, uh, some good processing in there. And it uh, allows the TV to do what it's designed to do. It supports 4K, so again, no 8K right now, but we'll, we'll start seeing how the evolution of that comes about. It'll be really interesting to see. But my personal preference is to have a dedicated device that's a computer type device um, in a Chromecast or something connected to the audio video receiver and let the audio video receiver do what it does best, which is process audio. Mm -hmm. Yep, good point. Thank you, Nick. All right, so moving on, um, th this is a feature that you might find really interesting if you're doing a combination of a home theater and a multi-zone installation in a home or even in a light commercial environment like a bar or a restaurant. Um, the Down on the Marantz receivers will take an HDMI input from a digital source with a, you know, a, a multi-channel or, or 3D audio soundtrack, and it will then down, down mix it into stereo analog to send to a zone two wired at the stereo like let's say for example you have a pair of speakers and, and outdoor speakers connected to the receiver let's say it's a 11 channel receiver you're using nine channels in the home theater you use the other two channels for a pair of outdoor speakers the receiver will automatically down mix that soundtrack data into two into two zones of analog to send to the zone two it will also send that down mix to the heos ecosystem so uh, let's say you are watching a movie and you'd like to listen to that soundtrack in the kitchen you can listen to it uh, on, on, a, on a local speaker, a HEOS or a down on home speaker in the kitchen, okay? Another feature that's pretty new, not everybody's using it, but it's good that you know about it, especially if you have uh, customers with families where let's say the grandparents are living with them and there's someone who's part of hearing and everyone's tired of having to crank up the volume on the home theater all the time. Well, what Bluetooth headphones simulcast allows is you can have someone listening with a pair of Bluetooth headphones listening to the, the, the audio of the TV uh, while everybody else listens to the home theaters. So there's a bunch of different ways to configure this. In the menu, uh, general menu under Bluetooth headphones, 
you can set it to either have the output mode in the home theater plus the Bluetooth headphones, or you could even set it to have Bluetooth only. If you have only, let's say, one person listening and you want and you want it to be quiet, then that audio would only be sent to the to the Bluetooth headphones. Of course, um, we would prefer that you sell down on Bluetooth headphones with your systems, but in fact, uh, this is universal Bluetooth. It'll work with any brand. Another feature that you guys might find interesting, if you have customers um, whose kids are really into gaming um, and you want the kids on your side convincing their parents to upgrade their receiver, um, the latest Denon and Marantz receivers have audio, auto low latency mode for gaming. Um, and simply put, this is just a signal that is that, that is output from the Xbox or the PlayStation via HDMI to the receiver saying, hey, I'm a gaming system. And when that happens, the receiver automatically enters this low latency mode and it disables a couple video and audio uh, audio features. And basically what it does, is it guarantees absolute audio video synchronization. So this is much more important with gaming than it is with a lot of other content. With gamers, man, the sound and the video have to be exactly synced. And that's what ALLM will do for you. Here's a handy feature that you'll all appreciate. You won't have to go in and rename your sources anymore. When you connect a source to the receiver via HDMI, um, thanks to the CEC protocol, the receiver will automatically detect the identity of the device that's connected. So in this case, let's suppose you connected to PlayStation 4 into the HDMI input that's called cable. The receiver will recognize it and will automatically change the name from cable to, to PS4. So it saves you a little bit of time. So here's the last big feature I'm going to spend time on, and this is not a new feature. Any of you guys who have installed Denon and Marantz, hopefully you've already used Odyssey. Um, Odyssey is not owned by Sound United. It's a third-party company, but Sound United has been a strategic partner with them forever. And Odyssey is a system for calibrating and optimizing the sound in any listening room um, using a microphone and a set of test tones and some digital processing. It basically equalizes every single speaker in the room for the best sound. And once you've done that calibration, you have access to a couple other features by Odyssey. And one is dynamic volume. Dynamic volume is it's a type of compression, so it minimizes the difference between the loud and the soft content. So why is this useful? How many times you've been watching TV, watching, let's say, a football game on TV, and suddenly the, the commercial comes on and the volume jumps? And so you're sitting there on the couch with your hand on the volume control, waiting for the commercial so you can quickly turn the volume down. And then as soon as the game comes back, you've got to turn the volume back up so you can hear the game. That's all very annoying. So what dynamic volume does, it compensates for the, that differential between the volume of different, of, different, um, of different broadcast data. Then there's dynamic EQ. And this one, this is a circuit that compensates for the psychoacoustic uh, phenomenon, which is that as you listen at lower volumes, you perceive less bass. We've all noticed this. Um, so if you want to watch a movie late at night, but you still want to perceive some bass, that's where dynamic EQ comes in. So it will artificially increase the level of the bass as you reduce the volume to maintain the perception of flat frequency response, right? But in order to enjoy dynamic volume, dynamic EQ, you got to do the, the, the you got to do the multi-EQ, which is the setup, right? Um, uh, there's a couple other advanced Odyssey technologies that I should mention as well. These are only found on the higher end receivers. One is called sub-EQ. This is a way of calibrating two subwoofers. And then low frequency containment is a way of preventing the bass from traveling through the walls and staying in the room. It's a psychoacoustic trick. So <coughs> why is calibration necessary? <coughs> Pardon me, just a moment. Um, well, if you think about soundtracks for movies, um, soundtracks are created for movie theaters by professional sound mixers. So here's a movie theater. And it pretty, looks pretty much like every other movie theater because movie theaters follow certain standards in terms of the size, the layout, the dimensions, the locations of the speakers. So it's pretty easy for a professional sound mixer to create a soundtrack that he knows is going to sound the same or very similar in every theater around the world. That's not possible in the home. Every single house is different. Every living room is different. For example, the sound engineer has no way of knowing if, for example, is there a window right here? And maybe it's open over here. So you have reflection on this side and no reflection on this side. Or maybe there's a curtain here absorbing sound and a blank and a bare wall over here that's reflecting sound. That kind of stuff, the detail of the room, the engineer has no way to know. So that's the whole reason why calibration is necessary and why it will help to optimize the sound. And that's what Odyssey does. 
So here's an example, a very crude drawing done by a third grader, apparently, of a sound source. Let's consider this, let's pretend this is a speaker, even though it doesn't look like one. Okay, radiating sound to these listeners. And you can see that these two people in the red group are perceiving this, this frequency response curve. These two people here in the blue group are receiving this curve, and this person in the green group is this one. So if you look at these three curves, you can see they're very different, meaning that these three groups of listeners are, are hearing a very different sound from that exact same speaker. And that's because, going back to my analogy, let's say maybe over here, maybe there's a curtain, so there's, there's no reflection. And maybe over here, it's a wall or a window, and there's a lot of reflection, those kinds of details. So what multi-key does is it, it improves the sound in every seat in the room. So here you can compare before and after using Odyssey. The curves in blue are the non-calibrated signals and the curves in red are after using Odyssey. And as you can see, in every case, the curve in red provides a much flatter or much closer to flat frequency response. So how does it work? When you open the box of the Down and Armorance receiver, there's gonna be this microphone in there, triangular shaped microphone. And you're gonna see a, a uh, stand made out of, of cardboard a folded cardboard that you can then unfold and create into a stand. Because when we do this measurement uh, of the room, this microphone needs to be at ear level. Okay? You don't want it sitting on the couch like that, unless you're always going to, unless you're going to watch movies with your head on the on the couch, which you won't. Doesn't make any sense. In the past, we would always use a tripod to put the mic at ear level. Well, now you don't need to, you don't need a tripod. We include in the box this simple paper stand um, to put it at the right height. So before you start testing the sound out of each speaker. Set your subwoofer at half volume, put the, make sure the phase is on zero, um, bypass any crossovers, make sure there's no background noise in the room. If you've got any lights that make buzzing sounds, you have fans. If you've got dogs, cats, or kids that are making noise, ask them to go to the other room. It's very important that the microphone only perceives the sounds coming out of the speakers. The other thing is before you do the Odyssey configuration, go into the receiver and tell it your speaker configuration. Do you have surround channels? Do you have height channels? Set that up so that Odyssey knows where it should be hearing the sound coming from when it hears those speakers. So you're gonna start by putting that microphone in a central position. So if there's only one person watching, where are they gonna sit? It's usually gonna be right in the middle. That's where you're gonna put the microphone first. You're gonna plug that cable into the front of the, of the receiver. And when you press start, you're gonna hear test tones. It's 10 pulses of, tone, of like white noise coming out of the left speaker and then the center and then the right, and it's gonna go all around and it'll end with the subwoofer. Then it'll ask you to move the microphone to the second position. So you move it over here, repeat the process. With most of our models, you can measure up to six positions. So you'd wanna pick the six positions that are most commonly used um, in, in the listening room. Once that's done, when you've done all these measurements, the receiver will take about five minutes and it will crunch the numbers and do the processing and it will apply correction points. So here's how Odyssey perceives the sound as, as, a, as a, a complex waveform from any particular speaker. And Odyssey will go in and apply an inverse curve uh, in order to get to a corrected sound from each zone. So uh, that's basically how it works. For those of you who are super nerds and really want to take this to the next level, you can purchase for $20 the multi Q Editor app available for Apple and, and Android phones. And this app gives you a much greater uh, range of, of adjustments and tweaks that you can make to the system. Um, if you really want to impress your, your customers with your knowledge, this is one way to do it. All right. There are different levels of Odyssey uh, available in both Denon and Marantz receivers. Generally, the less expensive receivers will have just the basic multi q with dynamic volume and dynamic EQ. And as you go up the product line, you get more and more advanced versions of Odyssey. This, this slide shows Marantz models, but it's the same thing with, with Denon. So uh, we're getting to the end here, and I, I'm not gonna run through every single model in the lineup, but I will explain that the Denon AVR line consists of two series. There's the S series and the X series. The S series uh, generally occupies lower price points and it's a little more uh, oriented to retail environments. The X series is the line that goes all the way up to the X8500 extremely expensive and heavy and high-tech receiver. The X-Series receivers are a little more oriented to custom integration and higher-end projects. So the handouts that Nick mentioned at the beginning that are available here, you can download these PDFs here from within the webinar. These are called step charts. And these are great as a tool to understand which receivers have which features. So the way you read a step chart is, you can see the line below the AVRS 540BT, that's our entry-level receiver, 
which does not have any internet capability, everything from this line below is actually available in all of these receivers. Now, if you spend a little more money and you jump up to the X650H, you gain the things in these four lines here, in this rectangle, you gain these. You have these plus everything below. From there, if you jump up to 750, you gain these features within these three lines here, et cetera. And that's how it works. All right, so that's the S series step chart and here's the X series step chart. These are both included on those handouts. All right. X series. Now with Marantz, we also have two different product lines in the receiver line, the NR series and the SR. The NR, uh, it's, it's a small lineup of just two models and you can see they're smaller in profile. So these are quite popular in rooms where they don't really want the electronics to be so noticeable or visible. Um, they're easier to hide away inside of furniture, et cetera. Just remember guys, if you're ever gonna install a receiver inside of a, a furniture, make sure it's got ventilation, okay? So the NR series is 60% the height of a, of a normal AVR, um, and it's you know it has its limitations. We can't fit a lot of amplifiers in there, so they don't they don't go very high end. They're the two entry level uh, AVRs in the Marantz lineup. Here's the step chart, and then the SR series we've got the 5015, 6015, 7015, 8015 four models in the SR series. In addition, Marantz offers something that Denon does not, which is uh, separates. So we have these very advanced preamp processors. There's two models, a 7706 and 8805A. Looks just like a receiver, except it doesn't have any amplification built in. It's just, it's everything but the amplification, all right? So all the processing, everything you need except the amplification. So generally you will sell it with an outdoor outboard amplifier, of which Marantz offers three different models, two, five, and seven channels. So you can combine these in any way you want to get the number of channels that you need. So if, if your customer wants a truly high-end, high-performance Marantz home theater, you're gonna probably wanna spec in a preamp processor together with these separate amplifiers. And that's really the way to get the maximum home theater experience from a Marantz system. Here, a little more info on those three power amps. All right. And uh, just to wrap things up, I wanted to mention a couple stereo products. Um, Denon has this product called the DRA800H. Marantz has the NR1200. Both of these products are designed to basically be home theater receivers that are only stereo, two channels. Um, we've all had those customers that are not interested in home theater. They wanna have good sound for TV. They just want a pair of speakers in stereo. So these products have HDMI connectivity and a lot of features you would find in a home theater receiver, except that it's just two channels, just stereo, the, the Denon and the Marantz. So those are good solutions for that. Furthermore, Marantz uh, is a little stronger in the stereo uh, component area than Denon. Denon has more receivers for home theater, but Marantz has more stereo products, including this line of integrated amplifiers. And the ND8006, which is a, a very high-tech streaming device, super cool product. Um, basically, it's it's a combination of a CD player and a streamer. It's got AirPlay built in. It's got Heos built in. It's got everything you need. That's the ND8006. And with that, we're right on the money. Look at that. One hour, Nick. I was worried about being able to fit it, all this content in one hour, but we did it. I Man, you, you, did, you rocked it. You did awesome. Even with my interruptions, very impressive. So <laughs> well done. Yeah. Uh, packed full of information, and uh, thank you so much.